Hey, everybody. Uh, much like we usually do, we'll wait a couple minutes and let everybody kind of filter in, and then we will uh, get moving. So just bear with us, and then I'll do the little housekeeping. For those of you just coming in, give us, uh, give us a couple minutes. We'll let people filter in and uh, then we will get rolling. I did send a reminder again about 45 minutes ago for final warning. Here we go. All right, um, I am a fan of being prompt, so let's go. Um, all right, so this is our third uh, college webinar. We've had the first two over the last couple of weeks and, and finishing the last one with San Juan alum, Peter Lowry. So Peter, thanks for being here with us. Um, Peter's um, hopefully can be a great asset to the club and to you guys having lived the college experience from a player perspective as well as from a college coach perspective at, at multiple levels and in and, and different parts of the country. So we are going to um, turn it over to him in just a second. Um, but just a reminder, all of our previous webinars um, are on the Baiga College Recruiting Library. All of the PowerPoint presentations are also there as well. We'll put this one up tonight and put it in there so you guys will have access to it. Um, and please go back and continue to utilize those as resources going forward as this information may change a little bit and evolve, but it's not gonna be dramatically different in three months or six months. Um, so no more of my voice. I turn it over to you, Peter. Cool, awesome. You can, Matt's controlling my slides, but thank you guys and thank I'm you, I'm controlling Matt, for, the slides so we can see his face. Yeah, um, for, for having me, obviously, I grew up in the area. I'm from Fair Oaks, currently live in Folsom actually right now. So I came back to the area just recently, but. Spent a lot of time all over the country um, coaching Division One college uh, and also working in, among a, just a lot of different programs and, you know, had the fortunate, uh, fortunate for me that I came through San Juan and it gave me the opportunity to play not only in college, but, but then again, um, afterwards in MLS a little bit. So uh, I really always have, as a college coach, wanted to help people from the area and I'm passionate about, especially Sacramento players, um, being one myself, because even though I had a little bit of a fortunate upbringing with lots of opportunities, it was still a tough path for me to navigate as a player and a tough path path as a coach to find players. Um, so I've had this kind of interesting 360 view of the whole process. And hopefully you guys can take some notes and at the end or as we go ask questions, um, Matt, you can always stop if there's a good question or um, we're touching on something that that somebody really wants to to really get a little bit deeper into. I'm happy to do that as we go. So there really are no silly questions, and and uh, I'll just kind of start at a higher level and drive into some things. So we can go to the next slide. There we go. Cool. So you know the big thing for me, and it's really obvious, is just being proactive. College coaches don't know if you are interested in them just by one email or. A, unless you are really consistent at communicating that interest to them. You almost have to treat them like they're fifth graders and make it really obvious and easy for them to know that you're interested in their program. So, you know, it might feel like you're over communicating or being annoying, but it is their job to deal with that level of annoyance. And it's not an annoyance, it's their job to read emails, to respond, to recruit, you know, as a college coach, you don't have to be the most amazing college coach if you're very good at recruiting because better players come to your program and it's easier to win games. So be proactive. Go bug them. 
you know, be annoying to them. Um, there really isn't ever somebody that's been too, too annoying at all the places I've coached. It's just making it easier and easier. I can always turn around and say no, um, but easier and easier for me to just know that that person is interested. And the other thing is consistent communication, even if you're not hearing back from programs over the course of three, six, nine months, it's okay. Things change in college programs, right? A player gets hurt to transfer. My needs, the, the kids that I brought in, they're not panning out, or maybe I need somebody else in that spot. So you just never know what's going on behind the scenes. So you want to be really consistent and proactive in reaching out to programs because you just, they'll never tell you, hey, things are imploding. Now I need three new center backs. It'll just happen to them. And all of a sudden their recruiting needs change. So you want to almost act like that could happen at lots of these different programs. And if you just email once or twice and you're not hearing anything, you're just really hitting in a small window where you're hoping something successful will happen. Uh, the other big thing for me is recruiting timelines. COVID has changed everything in that recruiting has been significantly impacted. This sounds really obvious, but what it's really done is pushed back the timelines on both the girls and, and the boys' side. So don't be nervous if things are happening later and later. And it, even if you have that sophomore friend that committed or early junior that committed or know somebody, it's happening so much later and later now than it ever was before. And, and I think for the better, um, especially with the new rules that you can't communicate as a freshman or sophomore, um, COVID really kind of hammered that home um, for college coaches being able to reach back out to you to convey interest. So don't be nervous. Um, understand that things are happening later and later, and that's okay. It's actually probably for the best. And I, I think we'll create less transferring and, Again, like more people creating relationships with coaches and finding good places to stay and play. So um, the other thing I would say is there's just a lot of opportunity out there, uh, especially for sophomores, juniors. Uh, the last couple of years have been tough recruiting years for college coaches. They didn't take big classes or they really struggled to find the right players or probably had some turnover or players graduate. It, it's actually COVID has also created a very difficult environment to manage players, bring new ones in. And so these next couple classes, generally speaking, at lots of these universities are trending to be slightly larger than before. So that's also good news. Um, and another reason to just go out there and go after programs. So uh, the other thing I like to touch on, um, you know, I coach at St. Mary's College at Lipscomb, which is a small D1 in Nashville and, and at Penn in the Ivy League. Uh, standardized testing was so, so important as an athletic recruit. Being a prospective student athlete, um, that standardized testing piece is so important. Uh, it is, and this sounds crazy to say it, and it really sucks for everyone going through four years of high school, working really hard to get good grades. It's the easiest thing to predict your success in college. The test is easier than the grades unfortunately, even at a pen where there's an army of people combing through the 50,000 applications, the standardized test was the best predictor of success. So, you know, you can take it in two ways. It's becoming slightly less important, but it's also the easiest way for them to quickly tell how successful you'll be. Lots of standardized testing has academic money tied to it or financial aid potential. Um, so standardized testing is just a nice thing to have at a lot of the, the, seniors I'm working with right now, even if they don't get the scores that they want, they don't have to put what their test is on their applications. So you can actually opt out as well in terms of, hey, I didn't get the number I wanted. So that is also an option that you can always just say, well, I'm not going to put that on my application to the school. So I really hammer home the standardized testing. I, I think, again, it's, it's just something that the earlier and the more important you make it, it's also something that can just kind of come off your plate. So if you wait to the end of your junior year, early senior year, it's something that can be really stressful. If it's something you really, you're like, well, I didn't know if it would be important. All of a sudden in a busy junior year where you're taking your hardest classes and you're going to ID camps and traveling all over with your San Juan group, like that's just another thing that falls on your plate that as a sophomore or early in your junior year or 
in between that December break, you're able to sit and, you know, study and test and get some sort of baseline score. It can be something that just kind of comes off your plate, um, which is a really nice thing in, in a really busy junior year. Um, so, uh, you know, the other thing I, I just like to really hammer home is let's just make it really easy on college coaches, make it really, really easy. You know, we get a lot of emails and are really busy, especially at this time of year where the season's going on. You want this to just be something that a college coach is like, you know what? That player was very easy to communicate with. They're somebody that I'm not going to have to worry about off the field, in the classroom, in my locker room. I'm just looking for somebody that fits in all the other things. So the only other thing I really need to look for is the soccer piece. And that's really what your goal is in a recruiting process is to just be an easy player to recruit and and make it just so very easy on them to take you and that really increases your odds an enormous amount so um let's jump into the next slide i have a question yeah since i'm going to be the purveyor of questions um you, you mentioned um freshmen and sophomores and the inability to talk um differently than they used to so are the players still able to reach out to the coaches or make phone calls? And what is the level of conversation they can have? Because I know we'll have some younger players on this with those questions. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You can always convey your interest until June 15th of your sophomore year. So after the end of your sophomore year, all of a sudden June 15th hits, college coaches can answer your phone call, can respond to your emails to convey interest or communicate that there's going to an event or, get you on campus. Um, but before that, they're not able to send out specific recruiting feedback to you via phone or email. So what they would have to do is the old school way where they reach out to your coach, your coach turns around and conveys that, hey, St. Mary's College just called me and I know you're still a sophomore, but they saw you play and they liked you. And that's basically the level of communication that you can have um, until June 15th after your sophomore year. Um, I still think, and I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit later in, in kind of my freshman and sophomore slides, um, go ahead and reach out and start making your list and go to ID camps as a sophomore. Um, but just understand that they won't be able to in person on the phone or email have that specific college recruiting con conversation with you. They can send back the general camp email. Hey, thanks for the email. Here's our camps, and you'll probably get lots of those over the course of playing at San Juan. Um, yeah, yes, I know you I will. Did. Yes, um, guys, make sure if you have questions, you can put them in the in the Q and A down below. One thing, Peter, my apologies when I introduced you, I didn't relay to these to everybody on here that this is actually what you do, um, walking potential student athletes through the process. Um, you have your own, and we'll talk about it at the end, but just so you guys know, Peter's not just a random person we added into this conversation. This is actually what he does as a business and helps players kind of na and student athletes navigate through the process. So we'll get there eventually, but I didn't want people to, to wonder. Sure. There you go. Cool. I like this slide. Uh, while talking about all that, it also shows that there's just a ton of opportunity to find a good place to play, um, both on the men's and women's side the list of programs and schools that have opportunities. And if you think about about 30 players on each one of these teams, there is a spot for you to play if you want to make soccer a priority. Totally understand and work with tons of kids that the academics have to factor in as well. And you're trying to find the happy medium of the two. Um, but there are lots of great universities and different levels. And I'll, I'll touch on the levels and the commitment a little bit later. Um, but this is just kind of a fun, wow, that's a lot of programs and teams and you know not as much scholarship but look i mean it's it's a lot of opportunity which i like go ahead man cool so for me when i'm working with kids i really like to get a process together where i get a profile page or a website together for them we go through a detailed process of making a list getting our highlight video together and then that that email communication and each one of these things will have another slide that we kind of get into it a little bit more um but you know for me this is a little bit of writing things down making lists 
thinking through this process and spending time on it pays off. It's no different than studying for a test. If you have a really big test and you want to go through the process of getting a good, of raising your chances of getting a good grade, you're going to go through a studying process. This is really no different. And unfortunately, many people don't really go after their recruiting process. Like it's the biggest decision you're going to make. It's where you're going to go to college. And if you're going to play, the teammates that you have are probably going to be your best friends for, and Matt can touch on this. I'm sure his Sonoma State buddies and him are thick as thieves, but they're your friends for life. And it's a joining a brotherhood or sisterhood of, of friends that you'll have forever. So spending a lot of time thinking about this process and the energy to go through it in terms of thinking and making a good list and putting a little extra time into your highlight video and emailing a little bit more than maybe everyone else does increases your chance at getting the better grade, which also means getting to the place that you want to go or a better place or potentially more options at choosing when you get there. Um, so this is a big thing for me, but, but we'll kind of get into the, the nitty gritty as we go. So we, we can jump into the next one. A list. Got a nice graphic here. Uh, I really like a list of 25 to 30 schools. Uh, as a college coach, it's important, and I'll talk about this list and, and then talk about why it's important from a college coach's perspective. I work with a lot of high academic kids that, well, I have a 4.0 or a 3.8. That doesn't necessarily mean that you deserve to go to the best academic schools that have soccer. So as a coach at Penn, I always got the email, well, hey, I have a 4.0. I guess that means I can play at Penn. And it was like, well, no, it doesn't. What it means is, yes, you potentially can, but there are a lot of people that email us. And so having a diverse list is really important at having a high potential for hitting a couple of programs on that list that have some genuine interest in you as a soccer player. So really important to have, and I'll go through it with the fun ones first, reach programs. So for me, I like having five to 10. Reach schools are schools that are an academic reach or a soccer reach or both. So, you know, Stanford's and UCLA's like obvious reach schools, they're really easy to email. They're fun. The reason why we make the list is so that you don't just email your reach schools. Hey, I emailed 10 schools. Nobody got back to me. Well, were they all the top UC D1 programs? Or did we then get into the target list, which is 10 to 15 of maybe more academically and soccer wise where I might find a match? So these can include non D ones for many people. Um, you know, where I like to use comparables uh, is the team ahead of you at San Juan. Where are those players committed to? Where are they talking to? Is that a similar player in a similar position? You know, using the team ahead of you, using your coaches, um, obviously an academic counselor or based on where your grades are trending. There's a lot of little clues to help you find schools that fill up this list. Um, this is probably a list where you might not get it perfectly right in regards to, well, these are clear. Here's my seven reach, my 14 target and my six safety. You have a general idea that most of the schools in this target, I might actually have a shot at playing at. I think I have teammates or friends that are, you know, talking or committed to these types of places. And academically, this isn't going to be like a huge leap where I might actually have some real chance at getting into the school um, or having just a little bit of help to get into that school. Right. So I don't think I've ever seen a UCLA or a Stanford inside that target list. Right. Um, and then there's safety schools. And it's a, this is my favorite category, and it's everyone's least favorite category. And I always have people start emailing from their bottom of their list to the top because the reach are really easy to do. Safety schools are places where you have a really good feeling that they'll like you soccer-wise. You can also be interested in them academically and obviously should be, but it's not maybe your dream academic school. And there's a few reasons to have five to 10 of these. Number one, if you're going to email 30 places, it's nice to have somebody email you back. So 
even if that is somewhere that you don't think is all that amazing, it's still nice to have somebody turn around and be like, hey, I liked what you sent. I liked your video. I'm going to come watch you play. A lot of the safety schools can be local schools too in regard to somebody that's going to have a higher chance of seeing you play that you can go get on campus with and maybe get your recruiting ball rolling with them. You don't always have to go there. They're going to be recruiting tons of other people. As a college coach, we had a list uh, of positions and needs inside the years. And there was anywhere from three to 10 people on those lists in terms of who we were going after. So it's okay for you to have that too. This is just how this works. You know, you're not going to be at the top of everyone's list and you're, you know, not going to be at the bottom of everyone's list if you do this right. So, you know, it is uh, nice to have those safety schools in terms of where you think you could genuinely get some interest and start at the very least, I'm going to get something going in my process. So the other things to consider, uh, geography, school size, right? Do you need to start, especially as a freshman, sophomore, even, even a junior thinking about obviously academic areas of interest and the reputation of the school versus kind of where you're trending grade wise and, and testing wise, obviously the soccer reputation. I like using the most accurate thing, which is the NCAA RPI. It is a really nice algorithm that just shoots out where everyone is ranked every single year. Um, and so if you're shooting for someplace that's at the bottom of the RPI every year inside of that division uh, or the top, that can make a big difference. Um, and then obviously once you kind of get into a recruiting process with the school, the coaches and the teammates and, and the culture of the program and, um, you know, if it's the right fit in all these different areas for you. So the very last thing I tell people to do is when you're making a list, never keep a program off your list or a school off your list just because the price of the university scares you. You really never know. And, and I, I'll use St. Mary's as, as an example. If you got a decent SAT or ACT score, we would be able to give you 30% scholarship or something right off the top. Um, financial aid is another awesome tool. And there's millions and millions of dollars in aid, in financial aid and academic scholarships every year for st student athletes or students, it doesn't matter who, and it's free money. As opposed to that slide that you saw a few slides ago that was just, well, here's the programs and here's our 9.9 .9 scholarships. That doesn't cut up very nicely 30, 35 ways. So don't put the price as something that keeps a school off your list because you never really know what they'll be able to put together for you. And there's lots of great private schools that can get you close to a public school education or, or more um, for that price. Um, and you just really don't know until you kind of go down that path and they show interest. Um, and again, you can always say no if it comes to money. College coaches go through this all the time. And hey, if it's a price thing, like, They'll try to help you as best they can, but sometimes it just doesn't work and that's okay. Um, it's not really, you know, anyone's fault if that happens. So uh, I would say it, it's more rare than ever that we can't make something work price-wise or at least try to find a way around it. It does happen, but it's not something that happens as much as you would think. Um, so, cool. Any questions about the list? Um, you know, I, again, as a college coach, really, really, really think this list is important to kind of think about it in this way because you don't want to just reach those targets or say, well, I had a friend and he just went there. And, you know, if you're kind of stabbing in the dark without a list, it really gives you a low chance of success. And, you know, the other thing is if you're going through this manually, you really have to think about all these things that are important to you and it helps kind of drive home what you want in a place and where you want to go to school and, and, and the type of soccer that you want in that environment. So I think it's really important and thus will give you a better experience as opposed to, I just got an email. I saw them play as a college coach. Okay. I'm going to commit them. I don't know very much about that player and they just emailed me once. Um, and I don't know why sometimes those are the players that find themselves in an unhappy home. If it's a quick recruiting process without without a lot of thought, it can be something that's 
a transfer potentially or going to cause some problems in my program if I don't do this right as a coach. And I want players thinking about it as thoroughly as a coach should be thinking about it. So, hey, Peter, not to not to um, take us off task, but you just hit on something that I don't think people understand. How important is it for you as a college coach to make sure you're graduating out your student athletes? Is there an incentive there? Is there a potential issue there if you don't? Yeah, it's one of my favorite things I talk about. Nobody is going to care about you at a university more than an athletics coach. If you fail a class, who's the first phone call you're going to get? It's not your professor. Your professor will not care, regardless of what school you're at. 99% of the time, they're not calling you to be like, hey, you failed the test or you're failing this class. They don't care. Your soccer coach calls you because they genuinely care that you graduate and are doing well because they get judged in probably five or six different areas. Obviously, the big one is on the field, winning and losing, but they also get judged and ranked on whether their kids graduate school, get their degrees on time, whether they can bring money into the university, whether you know they're causing problems like kids are cheating on their tests or there's some sort of integrity issue that's being dealt with. There's a lot of little things that coaches care about off the field just as much as they do on the field. That's why you're really trying to be an attractive recruit and make it easy for them to be like, look, in these three or four different areas, obviously not like raising money, this is somebody that I'm just not going to have to deal with. They're very easy to deal with in the recruiting process and clear and concise and consistent. I just, I'm going to deal with the soccer with them. And that's the dream as a coach is that's what you want to recruit. And, and ultimately as a coach, you don't care about the rest of that as much as the soccer. But if you have those other things in place, it just makes it that much easier. Um, but we abso absolutely care. A coach will get fired if his kids don't graduate. And if they're not graduating, they're not eligible. And thus, I can't feel the team. And so it becomes really important to me, especially for players that are contributing, they got to be eligible and be getting the grades and tracking through. You know, you get, it's kind of little known, but it's important to know, especially if you're going to transfer, you get five years to do four college seasons the day you graduate high school. So every year that you graduate and you are in college, or even if you're not in college and you take a gap year, you have to have a 20% degree completion every single year. So if you're not making your 20% or you switch majors or you transfer and some of your credits don't transfer, you have to be on the 20, 40, 60, 80, then I'm graduated track or else the NCAA won't even let you play, let alone if you drop below a 2.0, they won't let you play or that university will just pull your eligibility right off the table. So it's, it's kind of multi-pronged. Obviously, the coach wants to keep his job, wants to have his best players eligible, but also doesn't want to be dealing with these headaches off the field that is going to take his time and energy away from recruiting and coaching and all the other kind of aspects of his program. I once had a coach call me and tell me I was failing a class, Peter. I will admit that because mm. my math teacher called him and I mm. marched down to the math department and didn't fail the class because of my coach. They care cared, more than anyone. Cared. Yeah, they care more than anyone. Trust me, they really do. It's fun to have, but it's also, obviously, if you're going to struggle, not so fun sometimes. So I've sat outside classes before. I'm not ashamed to say it. So cool. All right. Uh, just kind of going into the divisions a little bit. Some some of this is really somewhat obvious. I like to say D one's just a full time job. It's hard to actually have a side job. You are, you know, you get one day off uh, during the fall season or your competition season, but the rest of the time it's training, weights, games, recovery, film. There's nutrition components. There's other off the field things that you get pulled into. There's potential study hall. There's, there's just a lot that goes into playing at the division one level. And it basically with going to school and doing your soccer feels very akin to not having very much time for anything else, let alone if you throw in a tough major or a tough university, it really can be a, a really big time suck uh, in a good way. 
but it is very much what a full-time job would feel like. Division two, there's just a huge range of schools from, you know, not so great programs to good programs in division one soccer wise, you actually hit a lot of places where you can play one of the worst teams and you probably will still struggle against them or you're not going to win 10 nothing in division two you could beat a team 10 nothing um the range from good to not so good kind of doubles um you know so there's a little bit less competitive programs to still some very good programs that can be division one caliber uh teams and then division three is is very different so there's obviously no soccer scholarships which mean the academic component um, becomes even more important. And there's much more of an off-season focus and school focus and potential to study abroad and and every, every other kind of interest that you could have, you can balance the academics and, and the soccer a little bit more. And then NC, NAI is its own kind of league and, and range of programs and schools um, from very strong to not so strong. And, and there's just a huge gamut of, of places and opportunities there. So, um, just kind of a quick slide, but it's also just really good to know. Great. So emailing schools. Uh, I'm a huge fan of emailing. It's so much easier for a college coach to email back, even if it takes him a while. We all use the same recruiting software databases. There's three of them. It's easy to fold people and their information into those databases through emails or filling out the questionnaire. Um, I like to keep things as short and sweet as possible in emails. Make this really, really easy for them. Don't talk about how you've been playing soccer since you were three. You know, you want to just, again, here's my info at a high level. Here's my grad years and, and club info and most up-to-date GPA, couple soccer specifics, and here's my contact info. You know, if you're, if you're really good at this, a lot of it doesn't need to change. Um, as you continue to email and you can keep using the same email chains to show that consistent con, hey, this is the fifth and sixth time this player has reached out. And this is just very easy for me to track his information over time. Phone calls are a little bit harder. It makes me have to do work and respond. And I have my email on my phone and I have my recruiting software there on my phone and on my computer. It's just a little bit easier for us um, emailing and we can always get on the phone or email you back asking for more. So I'm a huge fan of emailing. Um, and most of these programs and schools uh, use kind of Outlook or Gmail, which is really kind of nice and tidy for them as well in terms of how they organize their stuff. Um, I, there's a question and then I have a question. Um, yep. <clears throat> when you would receive um, emails or messages from some of the services that are out there, right? So some of the people mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, the big, the big services, and I won't name letters or names. Sure. How was that received from the college coaching side? It's my favorite question because I hated them and I've had different coaches respond to them different ways. We would always blast them back at one of the schools I was at with just, you blasted us. So we're going to blast you camp info. Um, Another one, we would just look at the highlight video. If it was something we wanted, we'd email back. If it wasn't, we just let it be. We didn't respond. Um, and this is probably hitting home for lots of people right now. Uh, and then at the other one, we did kind of a, a range of things in, in regard to putting them in our database so that we could say that we were recruiting them, but also spam them with camp stuff and try to track them. Um, I'm not a fan of those automated services and I'll, I'll tell you why if you go through the process of going to an athletic staff directory getting the emails and personalizing a quick email to somebody and then you're doing the work to send the email you're creating a relationship with a coach if you start it by blasting 100 schools through be recruited or ncsa or whatever um i'll say some of the names that's fine but you're also kind of shooting in the dark. And if East Mississippi emails you back out of the hundred that get blasted and you're like, well, they're the only ones that responded, I guess I'll go to East Mississippi. Then that's also not a great way of doing a recruiting process that gives you the best chance of establishing a genuine relationship with a program that you're interested in and coaches respond. If you've taken the time to send them an email, they'll know 
we all know if it's an automated email, we get hundreds of them a day at these top places. You know, that, that's the other thing I'd say is, you know, keep it concise because if you're emailing the top places or top programs or top schools, they're getting inundated with lots of emails. So you want to make it very easy for them to just see you at a high level, show that you're genuinely interested by doing the email yourself. You've emailed everyone on the staff. You are just making this very simple and easy for them to track you. And you're showing that over the course of months. That does not go unnoticed as compared to, I got an NCSA blast once or twice. And I, even though I clicked on it to watch your video, it then shot you something back that said, hey, Penn watched your video. It doesn't mean that I'm actually interested. I, I would just watch your video. So it's kind of false information back to you, even if somebody clicks on your stuff um, a lot of the time. Yeah, that's good. Um, so <clears throat> this is a question that was uh, asked in the box. Was there a particular type of email that resonated with you? Did it matter that players took the time to really customize their emails? I think you hit on that a little bit. Um, were your responses based on program needs or genuine interest in what the player had to say and or how they said it? It's hard to give a specific answer because each program is very different in how they like responding to emails and the needs of each program are constantly changing. And so, you know, ultimately the thing that got me the most excited was watching somebody's highlight video that was really good because as a college coach, the thing I care about the most is getting the best players into my program to help me win more games. Don't care about any of the rest of it. So the thing to convey the, the most is how you can be that, that player to help their program win more games. And doing that through a very nice highlight video, which is something we'll touch on next, um, or just, hey, I played this high-level club. I have good academics. This is a little bit about me and all my stuff that you should just know and my contact info, it's nice and tidy. Here's my schedule for this next showcase at Surf on Thanksgiving, like off we go. Like I want you to come watch me so that I can show you that I'm gonna be this player that can add value to your program. That, those two things, and most importantly, the, the highlight video or something soccer-wise that was like, oh, okay, I gotta learn more or do more about that player. Um, figure out, I gotta email that back or send this to the head coach or, um, I, I think I answered that. Maybe I didn't. Do you, do you no, I like think that? it was good. I mean, I think, okay. um, it's a good question. I would ask this. Um, we have, di we have players of obviously all different backgrounds and, um, personalities, if you will, how mm -hmm. important is it for a player to convey a little bit of themselves, right? A little bit of uniqueness to you as a coach um yeah. seeing as you're going to be dealing with this kid for four or five years and in the process you know you i know what i think but i just want to get your perspective yeah it, it is important um on the first email not as important for me because i don't know much about you um but it is important especially at the smaller schools that aren't going to get a ton of emails so you know if if I'm somebody that only gets five to 10 emails a day as a college coach or less, having somebody that's, hey, this is me. I'm, a I'm working with actually two girls that are marine biology majors. I really like this area of focus of your school. I love your soccer program. It really seems like a great fit. You're starting to tell a story that's like, oh, okay, yeah, this makes sense. This is why they're emailing. And, and that's a little bit of a specific example, but it also, just kind of creates this nice clean narrative as opposed to just saying, well, I have a three, eight and you know, I'm a forward, so you should probably like me. There needs to be something that tells a nice story that just kind of fits as opposed to, you know, this is me. I've been playing soccer since I was, you know, 10. And th those are two kind of examples of maybe not so great of a way to show your individualism versus Hey, this just might seem like a really nice fit for both of these reasons. Um, so I like that. I liked that better as a coach, as a as opposed to recruiting somebody that was like, "Whoa, you know, here's a ton about me," or "You should just like me because I fit academically." Okay, good. Next 
Cool. Highlight video. Probably the most important thing because it's something that's like the little appetizer before a meal. I, I want to see something that makes me want to see more as a coach. So the shorter, the better, actually, in a weird way. Um, if it's five minutes, can you get it down to four? If it's two minutes, you can always add some stuff that's coming up in the next couple months. One or two of those great highlights. You really aren't going to get recruited based on your highlight video as a domestic player. You just need to get somebody to say, I want to see more. That's your goal. So, you know, obviously best things first. I like talking about five to 10 attributes in your game. Really easy if you're a goalkeeper or something like that, but if you're a forward or attacking player, it's goals, assists. Then you're getting into, hey, I can press and defend. I can, you know, hold the ball up with my back to goal. I can have a couple combination play clips. And all of a sudden you've got to five, six, seven areas that have two to three clips and you're at three minutes and it's like, perfect, done. And I can always add a goal or take, take a bad goal out, put a better one in. Um, I'd rather have less and be wanting to see more than I got five minutes and it's all pretty average. Cause then I'm like, eh, as a college coach, if that makes sense, it's the biggest thing with highlight videos. They can always ask to see more. And that's kind of what you want anyway. Um, put your info on it, make it really easy for them. So they don't have to go back to your email. I like using YouTube. That's my number one, Vimeo number two. YouTube is great because it sits right at the bottom of your email. And it's just, it's like a tantalizing little thumb that's like, click me. And I'm like, yeah, I got time to click you and watch a minute or two. And if I like it, then, hey, guess what? I'm responding or putting you in my recruiting database or sending it to the head coach. Hey, what do you think? Um, and then, you know, the obvious stuff, nice, big, elevated angles, you know, get the Get the game film if you can from high level things like surfs and ECNLs and you know the the better the better the film and the better the context of the game that you can provide, the easier you're making it for us coaches. You know, I don't want to have to be guessing if this is high school clips, you know, hey, this is surf, these are our, our four games down at surf, you know, here I am as a player. Boom. You've made that really easy for me as a college coach to sit there and be like, okay, I got a pretty good idea of. The level he's at, the tournament, the games, like I don't have to play a guessing game if you're beating a team 10 nothing in high school and you scored a, an amazing goal from outside the box. Um, that's really what you're going for. And, you know, again, the, the context can be a nice, uh, a nice thing that you can add to, again, make it just very plainly simple for coaches to be like, here's a high-level player playing in a high-level game, doing some nice things. This is somebody that I think could potentially help my program win more games or find that right back that can get up the line, but also individually defend and distribute out of the back and be a part of a back four. Those are things I'm looking for. And they win headers. Wow. That's like, okay, who is this? There's my four things that I really care about as a head coach. Um, who is that? So that's really what you're going for in that, in that highlight video. Good. Um, anything not to have in there? Oof. Average clips, bad clips. Um, you know, especially if you're going to email high level places and they're going to have an assistant or a head coach that's got an hour to go through 20 emails, front load that stuff, get them interested nice and early. You know, even, even coaches at D2s and D3s, they got lots of other things going on. They don't have time to sit there and like wait for you to get into your clips and show me something. Make it really, really obvious right off the, the get-go. Here's this player. Here's his name, his info. Here's his clips. Boom. Here we are. This is a high-level player playing in high-level stuff. Uh, you know, the, the bios where you're talking or, you know, if you're a center back and you're talking about distribution and you're just passing side to side in the back, that, that doesn't get me excited. If you're, you know... Think about the stuff that you would watch in a, in a high level game. And that's the stuff that you want to be putting in these clips. And you'll kind of start thinking about it that way. If you start playing in these games, you're like, I'm going down the surf. I'm playing in this event. I, I know this was a good game where I made some good entry passes. I had a couple of good long balls. I won a couple of good headers. All of a sudden you're putting those clips in, in your mind 
to your highlight video ahead of time and kind of doing it backwards in a way. Um, not that you need to be thinking about that during the game, but you know, that's the fun part of playing, you know, the good stuff. Uh, and you want to kind of remember that and file that away and put it in there. I will, <clears throat> I'll add to this for everybody. Um, we have a, I have a player that sent me her video a couple weeks ago. And I said, uh, you're, it's, it's, the good stuff is buried. It's not at the front end, like do it again. And they mm. sent me a different version today. Um, and in 30 seconds, I said, okay, if I'm a college coach, I want this kid, or I want to minimally come see this kid. And I sent it to a couple of coaches and they said, I want to see her in San Diego, have her email me. So go, don't be afraid. My point is don't be afraid to ask for feedback to all of our players, send it to us and we'll look at it. And, and it doesn't need to come to necessarily Zecker or myself, but even your own coaches and say, Hey, what do you think? And we'll be honest with you. And if we think you should tweak it, tweak it. Um, this person also put in a good song that resonated with people who are, you know, in their late thirties, early forties. So that, that was a hit mm. too. That's always good. Cool. ID camps. Um, I'll touch on this briefly. I like that big ID camps, actually. I used to work them. Um, but again, if there's 20 to 50 schools there and 200 plus kids, you're only going to get just a small amount of exposure. You're not going to get fully recruited off that. So I would only go to those big kind of globo camps if you, and I use exact here, but there's lots of them out there. If you are still in the early processes of your recruiting and just trying to get noticed and circled on a list of 200 names to be like, ah, that was somebody that did something. All right. Like I want to see some more, or, you know, I know that team, I'm going to go watch them. That's really what you're going to get out of the big camps. I like the individual school camps for when you're in a recruiting process with a place. So flying across the country to go to Yale's ID camp, just because you really want to go to Yale has a low probability of success. But if all of a sudden you're, you sent to Swarthmore a bunch of your information and they're like, hey, I liked your highlight video. We have a camp coming up in a couple of weeks. We'd love to see you. Our head coach wants to see you or send us your schedule. That feels like, okay, maybe the time and money now makes sense to go to that. And I know this sounds really obvious, but you know, I've worked Stanford ID camps and I've worked all over the place. Um, you can go see the schools that are coming to these. You can ask, you can kind of make an educated, a very educated guess at, at what is the best time and money for that exposure that you're going to get. Um, and I like to talk about it because I feel like I get tons of questions about camps and, and that's the best way that I've kind of found to navigate through how to spend your money wisely. Good. Cool. Just kind of roll through some freshman action items. Uh, I really like it. You know, parents and players look at the teams ahead, see what they're doing, see where they're committing, see how their processes are going. Cause you can learn a lot from the people that are ahead of you. And San Juan's a great club where you can reach out to people that will help you. It's not a kill or be killed type scenario. So start using those older players and older teams and, and even coaches to, to figure out your list and where you should be thinking about going. And, um, you know, it, it can also change. So it's okay to have a list that changes over time. Um, you can email interest. You don't have to, I, I, you know, it's my opinion that you won't get a lot back except for on some camp lists that'll spam you a little bit. Now is a time for me where you do extra on the field to develop as best you can and get your grades to the best place that you can get them uh, and the classes that, that you want to challenge yourself to take. Um, seems really obvious, uh, you know, but it's a year that goes really fast as most of you know. So we'll, we'll jump into sophomores here unless anyone's got a question. Cool. Sophomores, now we should be editing that list. We should be feeling pretty good about where we're at in terms of our academics, we got a full year under our belt, maybe at this point a little bit more. We should probably have a highlight video or be getting it together to send out to that list of schools that you're making. You know, you have a nice early window to communicate interest before they're able to respond, to get them, you know, to see you as a player, to see how you're gonna develop, especially, you know, if you can be a college coach and you have a player that's emailed you over the course of a year or two or 
oh my gosh, three, and you've got to see how they develop, even through highlight tapes or the way they correspond. It just gives you a much better feeling of committing a player that you just, you're going to know better than somebody that you saw once and you commit or they emailed you and you're like, uh, all right, let's go with it. You're just making it so much easier for them. So there really isn't too early of a time to communicate, but now would be a great time to start having a pretty good list together, get that email out with those highlights, start thinking about our testing and test dates. You know, as a recruited student athlete, so a prospective student athlete, there is zero penalty for testing 10 times. Do you want to take a bunch of standardized tests? Lots of places allow you to super score. You know, I know it's not fun to take these things and it's expensive, but also there is no penalty at any university for you taking a bunch of these tests to get an awesome number that could get you some academic money that could get you into a better school. So doing some testing or prep um, is always a good thing uh, inside of that sophomore year. And you can always take a section again or take it again or, you know, again, time and, and money and finances uh, allowing. Uh, and then the last thing is start planning for some ID camps. Start kind of trying to get yourself out there, get some feedback um, and see if, you know, this is something, get, get on some college campuses potentially. W where do I fit in? Where do I think I'm trending in terms of um, how this last year is going to go for me and, and potentially as a junior and senior, how I'm going to commit or find a program to commit to? <clears throat> Something just popped into my head. Uh, can you tell the difference between a email, an email written by a player versus a parent? And which would you prefer? I know the answer, but. The player, I absolutely can tell. Um, I actually don't mind typos. That sounds crazy. It shows that somebody authentically sat there and wrote it and had to put thoughts to paper. Um, I have actually told people that even at Penn, like, fine. You had a typo, like most people that emailed Penn didn't, but like, great, like that shows that you had to sit there and think and send me an email. Uh, and you as the player are creating this relationship with a staff of coaches that are, this is an important relationship. They're gonna coach you for four years. You should have a good feel for them and they should have a good feel for you because they never talked to your parents. I don't think Marcus ever called your folks probably during the course of your time at Sonoma State. Like that's just something that, we don't care about that relationship. We care about the kid because we got to coach them and manage them through this process of, of college, which can be a little bit crazy. So the more you get to know them, the better. And the more authentic that relationship is, the better for both and the more chance of success of that relationship. Really obvious, but it's probably what you thought I'd say. Uh, that is what I thought you'd say. Uh, I see somebody's got a raised hand. If you can put your question down in the Q and A box, that is the best way to get it to us. Um, or you can email it to me, I guess. That would be the only other way in this moment. Yeah. Junior year, your hardest year, hardest classes, tons of stuff going on. You wanna make it as easy as possible on yourself before this time, because you're just, you're gonna be inundated with everything, right? So. You're editing that list. If you've sent a bunch of emails out and you've sent two to three emails, maybe three to four even, and you're not getting anything back, it's time to kind of look at your list and say, do I need to edit this? And hey, maybe I'm a high academic kid and I emailed all these top academic places and nobody emailed me back. Maybe that's a little like starting to be like, well, maybe I need to manage my expectations at either finding one of these places or Maybe I need to lower my level soccer wise. And that's feedback that you'll get because if you do a detailed list like that, the list will give you feedback based on who responds. And it's also okay to not have soccer be like this, you know, enormous thing. If you get into an amazing school and I've worked with plenty of kids that if they get into UCLA, they're going to go to UCLA and that's fine. Like that's an amazing thing. It just probably means that soccer won't be a part of your time there in a division one capacity. But that's okay. Um, you just are starting to get feedback that some of these schools that you're emailing are either going to be emailing you back or not. And you can take a look at your list and start managing whether you think soccer wise, that's a correct list based on where you're trending as a player. You should have really good highlight videos um, at this point, or at least an updated junior year highlight video. 
uh, again, if you have YouTube, you have multiple, you can just create a channel and put your three or four or five or whatever you want to do. However, however much you want to put into it, each showcase, you have a short two minute highlight video. You have a junior year and a sophomore year and a freshman year video. However, it is that you want to do that based on what you have. I know with COVID, everyone's going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, it's just nice and clean for somebody to sit there. And I've, I've done that on YouTube, looked back and saw, saw how somebody progressed from 15 to 16 to 17. And was like, oh, okay, yeah, that was really nice for me to see. Um, and so your, your, your initial email, you know, should be awesome. And then in terms of an awesome first email, it's, hey, this is me, this is my intro. And then after that, they're really easy update emails. It's, here's my new highlights, here's my new GPA, here's my testing date, here's my tournament schedule, you know, a, a week before it comes out. Here's, here's little updates. And you just keep peppering them with these consistent little updates. The, the first email is the hardest, doing the list and getting everything going. But then after that, it becomes pretty easy to, hey, here's my surf schedule. It's coming up. I'm going to send it out in a few weeks. And this is where we'll be playing. I'd love to see you come. Um, you know, I noticed you're coming or not or wh whatever you want to say in it. Those update emails are pretty easy to roll out once you kind of get yourself going in this process. And Again, I, I like I like players to be consistently emailing over six months. Just to who knows what happens six months down the line. I was I was at Ped and there's a player from Chicago and we weren't very interested in maybe tenth on our list of center backs, but he emailed every other week, gave us updates on his games. Just he made it so easy for us over the course of nine months that we actually had a center back issue. He had the grades, he had everything kind of tidy off the field for us. And it was something where it was just like, yeah, this is just going to be a fit. And we're in a little bit of a pinch now, but he has showed just this very easy, consistent process to us. And so we know what we're getting with him. And again, the, the standardized testing, the ID camps throughout the year, you, you know, you want to try to take as much off your plate as possible um, in this junior year, because this is, this is your hardest year. Um, you know, you're, hopefully following some soccer programs and games, especially right now when it gets really fun and it's postseason, um, and maybe going to some games, um, but also those demands. So, so again, I, I can't say it enough. Can you test early? Can you, you know, do these ID camps earlier so that, and in these nice transition times so that you make this year a little bit easier on yourself and it doesn't come down to, Oh my God, I have to get this test on, this day at the end of my junior year to even be, you know, able to look at some of these schools or, you know, I'm, I'm putting pressure on myself by taking this honors or AP class or w whatever it is. You, you want to take that pressure away as, as best you can. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> I know you don't have a senior action items. I don't think, I don't. right? I'm thinking about it. So I don't. Go ahead. No, no. If you're going there, I'm just I'm gonna set the table for you. Sure. I I don't in that I don't work with a ton of seniors. Um, it's crunch time. The windows and spots are are certainly going. You can absolutely still get picked up. You can absolutely have opportunity. It's just a far less chance of finding it. Applications are certainly going in. You just I still think you you go through a process, even if you're not being recruited as a senior right now, because you never know if you're able to walk on to places um, and you give yourself a chance. Uh, yeah, I, again, I, I picked it a little bit because applications are going on right now and most schools have, are pretty far along in their recruiting. Um, but if anyone does have senior questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about them and talk about my experience as a coach recruiting seniors late. Hey, Pete Zeka. Um, quick question for you. When, when does a player, uh, maybe you can share maybe a little story regarding, I think a lot of us don't want to take a no for an answer. Some of the players are caught up sometimes on, let's say Stanford, you know, so you've been to their camps, you've been to mm. surf cup, you've been to every Senate showcase and they keep kind of hitting, um, on the same spot. And even though sometimes, you know, they do, you know, they will communicate with Matt and I regarding, no, you know, we're not interested. 
And those players continue to somehow go into their camps and, and, and kind of somewhat waste money, right? Mm. Well, what's your advice that you have and in terms of one no becomes no, I guess? That's why I like the list is because you could always reach out to those reach programs and they're really easy to reach out to and it's fun and it's the dream, right? Like to land at the Stanford. Um, but if you don't have the rest of that list nice and tidy, then you get stuck with whatever is left over that nobody else wants. And so there's the horror stories of, I played with a kid back when ODP was a big deal. He was the captain of the ODP regional team. And he just thought teams would come to him and he was going to go to UCLA and it, UCLA didn't end up wanting him for whatever reason. And he got stuck at a D2 and was very unhappy um, because he didn't go through the process of the list and having those backups. Um, so look, you could spend as much money and time as you want at those reach programs. It doesn't mean that they're going to watch you ever. That's why you have to have the rest of the list and be consistent with your emails to them. Uh, and, and interest in them because you're not guaranteed the dream program. Good answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I stopped sharing because I mistakenly clicked off of it. Um, are there other questions before we wrap this up? I've seen a couple of people shoot up their hands, but I don't, that doesn't help me other than to, to wave because I can't, um, I can't let you talk on it so if you have other questions um i wrote one down this is a question for me peter um because obviously you've worked on you've worked in the northeast you've worked in this i guess tennessee would be the south and you've worked on the west coast um in general because i know you can't this is a kind of an arbitrary question but how was the recruiting for most of those places was it more regionally based or was it more nationally based when it ultimately came down to the kids that you end up um, really recruiting and bringing into your program. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's a good question. Um, each program is obviously a lot different. Um, at Penn, it was national because we could recruit across the country. and We had a big enough name. Um, at Lipscomb, it, it was a little bit more local, kind of Southern Texas, things that we thought we had good shots at. Um, you know, I, I was going through my recruiting process and I wasn't very keen on West coast or East coast schools. Cause I didn't want to go to someplace cold and they know that too. So, you know, there is some of that in terms of the coaching bias of what they think they can attract and the amount of time and money they're willing to spend it going after those recruits. But on the flip side, um, you know, the women's coach at Penn, when I was there almost exclusively went after California kids because she just was the ex Stanford assistant and was like, there's tons of kids that want Stanford that aren't going to go to Stanford and I'm going to scoop them up um, and made a nice little program out of it. So you find both sides of it. Um, you know, at St. Mary's, we didn't recruit, you know, East of Texas. Um, you know, if, if we wanted to recruit East of Texas, we recruited internationally. Um, and that's really how St. Mary's got pretty good on the men's side. So, you know, it, it really ranges based on, the coaches and then also kind of the reputation of the school. Um, right now I'm actually finding that because of COVID, most schools generally speaking have gone to hyper localized recruiting because they weren't able, unless they were in Arizona or Texas or Florida to go out to a lot of stuff. So they did a really good job in their backyards of knowing the coaches that were in their area and trying to clean up their area and, and get those local kids that they're able to see once or twice or know the coach and, and feel more comfortable with committing, especially in a, in a tough time. But I don't think that'll remain now that kind of everything's gone open um, and, and everything's kind of somewhat back to normal, I'll say. Yep, fair. Um, thank you. Uh, Z, anything else? No, it's awesome. It's good seeing you again, Pete. Yeah. And, and maybe we can bring you back somewhere in March to the workshop. We're talking about creating a workshop in the spring. Uh, we would love to have you back. Yeah. Well, if anyone does want to ask questions or needs any specific help, I'm also happy to help. And I live in the area too, so I can even meet with people, which is couldn't do for yeah. a while. Um, so always happy to help. And I, I really do uh, 
you know, do this now and, and help lots of people and everyone's in a little different circumstance. So I'm, I'm happy to help and happy to be asked to be a part of San Juan again. So well, we appreciate it. So right, here's what here's what we'll do, everyone. I will upload the video of this tonight. It'll go into YouTube. I'll put it in the bike as soon as it's done. So you have access to it. Peter, if you can, um, as long as you're okay with it, are you okay if I share that slide, those slides, the PDF? Sure. Okay, and then maybe add your contact and website on there, so that way I can okay. just send me another one with that, and that way people can get a hold of you directly if they have questions. Sounds great. Um, and I'll put that I'll put that onto the site. So uh, for everyone, that is our third and final one um, for the fall, uh, third and final webinar. Um, all three of them have been a little bit different. So Peter, thank you, because I think getting the um, most recent college coach perspective has been is really good. Right, because that's where everybody's always trying to get in your guys' heads um, or trying to figure out why aren't they responding um, or mm. what's going on. And the reality is they're in the middle of a season and they're trying not to get fired um, right now. So sure. <laughs> that, is, that is the reality of the beast. But uh, we appreciate it, man. Um, San Juan Predators for life, right? Was that what you were? Mm. Your predator? Yeah. Okay. Was, yes. That's right. So. That's back when the that's back when the teams had their own individual names, guys. The, and that uh, was the, that was the best club, best team in a club in the history of the club. I think you're inaccurate, but I think we we will we can quibble later offline. But it was we were very good. good. I, we didn't get named. The club wasn't <laughs> named. Uh, it was named. Was it Lightning? Yeah, that's that's not or Arsenal. That was after. Yeah, we, that was we, after our yeah, we changed. We changed that later. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. And P Peter also, <laughs> for those of you guys that don't know. Sister actually play in the spirits of 82, 84. 84. 84. Lisa was spirits of 84. So and Danny, too. my little brother. The whole yeah, family, so yeah. Lightning. Dan was on the Lightning team, the 88, yeah. 88 Lightning Incredible. group. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Incredible. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Pete. Back to real life. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll, uh, we'll catch up very soon. See you on the field. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Night. I guess. Good night.